That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 100 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 12th of August, 2022. I am Conal O'Moran. Yes, indeed, we have made it a century of podcasts. And if I haven't crowed about it enough already, we have very recently been a Best Business Podcast nominated for the Irish Podcast Awards, a nod that we're hopefully doing something right. If you agree, you can vote for us in the public vote on irishpodcastawards.ie. Sharing the love is what it's all about. And remember, it's that great business show. Start with that. So to the 100th edition, we had a long chat about who to invite for this oh-so-special event. When you're having a celebration, you want to have your friends around you. And the biggest friend this podcast has had since the very start is a man called Tom Murphy. Yes, you've heard me mention him very often, but always with good reason. One of Tom's companies, De Facto Shaving Oil, has been our title sponsor forever. Without that backing, the podcast, which has already highlighted well over 300 companies, more than half of them women-led, would not, could not exist. Tom has a great backstory of his own that culminated in his writing a book called It Never Started on the Late Late Show, but that is another story. For anyone and everyone in business, what you need to hear is Tom on adversity, how the bleakest times for him turned into business success. If your business or job is in the poo, stay listening. Because even on episode 100, we are strictly business. And Tom, who also owns a pharmacy distribution company called Pamex, based in Castlebar, County Mayo, is here to share his many, many business insights. Tom, it is my hugest pleasure to say to you, Tom Murphy, welcome to That Great Business Show. Well, thank you very much indeed, Connell, and I'm delighted to be here. I don't know where to start. I mean, you've been telling me stories an hour or two hours ago that if I had any hair, my hair would be standing on my head, but they don't. Anyway, my bald head. You are full of stories, but we won't go there today. Okay. Today, you're going to t- tell me about the day you were made redundant, because that was a bleak day, and you bounced back. Mm. It was indeed a bleak day. That's that's going back quite some time now to 1994, and uh, I was general manager of Syntex Pharmaceuticals in Ireland, and our company was taken over by Hoffman La Roche, Roche Pharmaceuticals, and it was the first time ever, actually, that uh, a European pharmaceutical company had taken over an American company because Syntex had a manufacturing plant in Clare Castle in County Clare, but they were uh, based, their headquarters based in Palo Alto in California. And they had uh, an office in the UK as well. And you were doing well and you were doing fine and out of the absolute blue, what happened? Out of the blue, the company was taken over and as happens in such circumstances, you have uh, bargaining uh, chips, let's put it that way, and people's lives go one way or go the other way. And I lost out on the position in Ireland and so I was given a choice. It was a very stark choice at the time. Uh, Take a position as a medical rep in the West of Ireland. Now, you had been the boss. I had been the boss. Yeah. Yes. So, I so you start. served your time as the medical rep for eons yes. before that. That's correct. I was 20 years with Syntex and all. And they said, uh, we'll offer you, uh, the new outfit said, we'll offer you a job as a rep in the west of Ireland and uh, you will stay at that position. Did they say Full that? stop. Yes. Talk about lack of respect and space stupidity. Yes, exactly. So you felt really warm and cuddly towards them. Unbelievably warm, <laughs> accordingly, towards them. And my redundancy was sorted out on the 24th of December, 1994. Okay, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. All yep. Right. And you chose what? I chose not to go with the new outfit. That's a surprise. The new company. <laughs> uh, yeah, I decided no. And I said, maybe it's a time to reflect. I got a very good uh, redundancy package. 
And I said, maybe that would give me the impetus uh, to start uh, something on my own, you know, or something with... with Had uh, that been niggling at you? Because I'm always interested and intrigued and I'm also trying to encourage others to make that leap. Uh, it hadn't been niggling at me that much. It had uh, over the years, yes, right from the time I was a young fellow. And, uh, but I suppose that was really the kick in the pants that I got. I said, OK, let's see what we can do now. And at first, uh, what I did was I applied to, I sent out 61 CVs uh, to companies and I got one acknowledgement from the 61. And no jobs. And no job offers uh, from those. And I did get a job offer from a company that I had been doing business with and I hadn't applied to them for a job offer. But that job offer did not suit my skills. So I decided not to take that. So at the end of all that, you know, I learned a lot from that. What uh, did you learn? Well, I learned that if anybody apl- if anybody applies to uh, Pamex Limited, our healthcare <laughs> company based in Castle Bar, if anybody applies... That's to the ad and you'll hear plenty more of those, yep, I can tell you. Yeah, Pamex, P-A-M-E-X. And uh, what we do is, uh, or what I learned from that was, if somebody applies to us for a job, they will always get an acknowledgement. They may not get a job, we may not have a vacancy, they may not get an interview, but they will always get an acknowledgement. And I think uh, I don't agree with it when companies, big and small, decide, oh, well, they have so many people writing in, applying to them for jobs and everything like that. And perhaps not in just these months, so to speak, but uh, when they say we get so many that we just can't cope, we can't answer them. I think that's uh, a cop out. I think if somebody goes to the trouble to sit down and apply for a job, I think they should get the at least the courtesy of an acknowledgement. Now, people pay me a lot of money to give them communications advice, and I'm going to shoot myself in the foot by telling you and telling the podcast listeners one of the key things that I always tell them is if you're trying to make contact with somebody, write a letter. And I believe Tom Murphy, that's you, is a great letter writer, believer as well. Uh, I am. Not uh, in in the sense that I don't write reams, <laughs> but I do believe in 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 uh, writing a short note. And for instance, with every customer who buys de facto shaving oil, that's on, the un- another ad uh, <laughs> on online from us, they get a little note signed by myself thanking them for the business, because I think sometimes business people forget that customers are the reason we're in business. If we don't have customers, we don't have a business. And I think, you know, customer service brings the customer in the first time, but it's customer satisfaction that brings the customer back. And every person in business would say, oh, that's a great idea, but I haven't got the time. You can get them pre-written. You can write them yourself, copy them and sign them. There's no problem. But at least it means that you care about the customer and you're thanking them for contributing to the business. Now, we deliberately did not agree what questions or answers or anything else like that we were going to have a chat about beforehand. So my question about those or that letter writing to you, Hmm. did you ever get any business out of it? Did you ever get any satisfaction out of it? Did you get any... What did you get out of that? Uh, I got a a lot of people who phone our company might have a query on our products. One of the products are indeed on de facto shaving oil. And, uh, you know... I'm often there in the office and the receptionist would say, well, Tom Murphy is here if you'd like to talk to him. And we had one interesting individual who phoned us a few months ago. And the guy says to our uh, lovely receptionist, Rachel, uh, he said, actually, I didn't think it was a live person called Tom (laughs) Murphy. I just thought it was a kind of a nom de plume that was used, right? Because he said, I could never ring up Gillette and ask to speak to Mr. Gillette. And he was told, no, but there you can certainly speak Gillette to... Once upon a time of course though, there was, there was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, but they can ring up and speak to Mr. Murphy and we will talk to our customers. And when somebody rings our office, they get an actual human being answers the phone, not press one for this, press two for that, all that kind of rubbish. Does it bring in business? It makes you feel good, probably yep. makes the customer feel good. Yes. The handful that ring, because mm. I don't presume a lot of people ring, Quite a, no, quite a number of they, people. They? Quite a number of people. Yeah, they might have a query with an order. Yeah. They might be looking for further information on a product. Yeah, and we're there to help them. But is he, are you, say somebody says uh, has a query about an order, they're hardly going to be put through to Tom Murphy, are they? No, if, if it's relating to me, mm-hmm. but if it's relating to marketing, if it's relating to a specific product, if it's relating to finance, they'll be put through to exactly 
the individual who deals with the query. Now, we have gone down a rabbit hole, as usual. So let's go back again to you. Made redundant, 24th of December. You took the package. Uh, you applied 61 times for jobs. Didn't get any answers. What happened next? Well, what happened after that was I uh, sat down with my good wife, Mary, and we decided maybe we'd have a crack at this. And, and a crack something at this being what? To set up something on our own. We had done so before in 1979. We had opened up a shop while I was still a medical rep, a junior medical rep with uh, Syntex at the time. We had set up a wool shop, a knitting wool shop in Castle Bar called Wool and Woolies. But there is a reason for that as well, isn't there? There was a little bit of history there. Yes, because my mother had a, a knitting wool shop and there were only three knitting wool shops in Ireland at the time. <laughs> Mad, isn't it? Yeah, that were just specifically yeah. sold knitting wool. A lot of other shops sold knitting wool, but they sh- sold other items as well. Right, But this was just knitting wool or anything to do with knitting. And there was a shop in Dorset Street in Dublin owned by my aunt called, believe it or not, The Wool Shop. Right? (laughs) And she was a wonderful lady and she actually designed quite a number of the knitting patterns. You're too young to remember those now. The knitting patterns for Sunbeam Woolsey in Cork. And because of the involvement of my aunt with the shop in Dorset Street, my mother decided to ha- open a shop at her own house in Castle Bar. And there was another shop in, I think it was called the Winthrop Shopping Arcade in Cork. And there was a knitting wool shop there. So 1979, we, Mary and I opened uh, Wool and Woolies in Castle Bar. And you knew everything about the business, but it didn't last. Uh, we knew a lot about the business, not everything. We knew a lot about the business, but it didn't last. And the reason why, because people really stopped knitting. Oh, OK. Now, <laughs> they're back knitting now, yeah. right? But they stopped knitting. And they were buying all these cheap clothes, fast fashion, as they call it nowadays, right? Wear it for a short while and dispose of it. And yet it didn't put you off being an entrepreneur on your own time. No, but I learned a lot. What did you learn? I learned how to manage money better. I learned how to deal with um, the legal aspect of it, like uh, having a lease on a premises, Uh, dealing with the landlord and everything like that. And I also learned that, you know, if you deal with people, generally speaking, if you deal with people in a nice, positive way, they'll be nice and positive to you too, in most cases. And that happened to us because we had a few years to run with our lease on the shop Wool and Woolies and the arcade in Main Street in Castle Bar. And and the landlord uh, said, OK, you're not going to make it. So he said, let's call it quits. Whereas he could have said, you owe us for the next five years or whatever. But he didn't. And that was, you know, we remember that and we were very, very appreciative of it. And I love a good pun. So I've just thought of this. You learned not to stick to your knitting. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. But you must remember, when I started off on the road in uh, almost 50 years ago, my first job was selling knitting wool. Okay. So I called <laughs> on every shop in the country, except in Dublin, selling knitting wool. And I went over to Wakefield in England and learned how the wool was carded, how it was threaded, how it was dyed, all that. Came back here to Ireland, got my, was absolutely thrilled. Uh, I didn't uh, choose the university route. At that stage, all that I wanted was my driving license and the leaving cert. And I got both and I had my uh, Ford Escort Estate. 9445Z. Okay. And that was the first company car I had. Back to the big decision to go out on your own, yourself and Mary sitting there, and you obviously had to sit down and think, what will we do? You obviously tried knitting, that wasn't going to work. What else did you beforehand, way, way before yeah. that. What, yeah. else, what else did you think of doing? Yeah, we looked at uh, a number of franchises, went to a franchise show in the UK, looked at, the, looked at uh, what was available there. And? We looked seriously at snap printing. Did you? We did. Yeah. And we had a meeting with the, the, the top guns here in Ireland, uh, Mick Carney and those. I uh, knew Mick Carney. Yeah. yeah. We had uh, uh, a chat with them. And uh, the other guy, I can't think of his first name, Murphy is the name. And now, why uh, did you not go with Snap? We decided just it wasn't for us at the time. But Something just he- held us back. We decided not, not to go down that route. All right. So we looked at, you know. Are I the weeks tra- are passing by now or is it yeah. months are passing by? Uh, months. Months, months. 
And and uh, what happened was uh, I was looking at um, you know various aspects of the pharmaceutical industry, and I knew it had been there for over twenty years, and uh, knew everybody in it really because it was a small knit group at that stage. And uh, I said, okay, what do they do in the pharmaceutical industries? The pharmaceutical industry, what they do is they promote the products that are going to give them the fastest return. Okay. Okay. Hopefully with the greatest benefit to the patient. And I said, but they have a lot of other products and a lot of them just, as I call it, fall off the back of the lorry. So I said, if we could get a system in place whereby we could borrow, inverted commas, the products that fall off the back of the lorry and put those together, we'd have a nice product portfolio and we could still flog them, sell them, for the benefit of the patient, at a profit, right? And make a little business out of that. And that's exactly what we did. And I was approached by um, a chap in the UK who had previously been the marketing director for Syntex Pharmaceuticals in Ireland. Uh, He he contacted me, Glenn McKinnon was his name, and Glenn says, look, he had now moved on, Syntex was no more, and he had moved on and he said... uh, I'm involved with the company now and we it's a company called Chauvin Pharmaceuticals and we sell Minim's eye products in Ireland. They're practically going down the tubes. Would you ever think of taking on the products for us and breathing new life into them and selling the products for us? And I said, I know nothing about the eye business. He said, don't you worry. He said, we will train you. I said, okay, let's give it a Go, and we and, did. And this thing of saying yes, it's mm. a theme that we've noticed in the on the podcast. You say yes and then worry about it. Mm. Was that your, kind of your approach? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was, yeah. But it worked. And because? It, worked, it, it worked very well because we took on their product and uh, from Chauvin Pharmaceuticals. And the main brand was called Minim's Eye Products. And anybody in the eye business knows Minim's eye products. They're still in business, are they? They're still in business, oh, yes. Good for them. They're now good. owned by Bosch and Lam, and they were sold by Bosch and Lam onto another company. And uh, we brought their business up from approximately 200,000 up to, I think, about 1.6 million. Over? Over a period of 10 years. Okay. So right. they were happy with you? They were very happy with us. They were so happy with us, actually, that they decided that they were going to take on the products themselves. So and you build it up say and then bye nick bye. it on. Oh, yeah, go mm. on. Then, but happened? they didn't have their homework done. Yeah. Because we were the Irish agents, yeah. not the Irish distributors. Mm-hmm. So we took them to court. Ah, okay. After much serious consideration. Yeah. And I know you probably are aware that it can be a very uh, long process in Ireland if and you take somebody to court. And, and extremely expensive. And we were only a very small company. But we stuck with it. And we won, handsomely. Oh, good. In Paris. Oh, even better. Yeah, through French. (laughs) (laughs) Because they were a French company. (laughs) And when, what years are we talking about now? Uh, About 2016, I think it was, uh, or 2017, around then, it was finalized. So you, did you hold on to the product at that stage? No, 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 the product was gone from us at this stage. But we felt that we, we deserved, and under law, we deserve compensation for building up their business. So we were awarded damages accordingly. So let's talk about law and the business. Are you a reluctant going person to go to law or are you happy there or what you're thinking about that? Well, if it's a legal conflict as such, I I'm, would generally avoid it as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's the way I still feel about it. Yeah, but, you know, the legal issues can be oh, multifactorial in, in a business. When you talk about, for instance, if you talk about de facto shaving oil and we have to have the trademark uh, approved and confirmed in so many countries and we have de facto registered trademark in our name, in the name of Pamex Limited, in every country in Europe, in the UK, in Canada, uh, in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand, and you have to get somebody who is expert at that to take on the product and you get their advice as to whether it's you know, the trademark will work or not, and whether you can defend it. Well, the defending, and I keep going back to this frequently again on the podcast, that uh, trying to defend something like that, particularly if you're, you don't even have to be a small company, it costs so much that Mm. actually 
it's probably not really worth the while, is it? Um, it depends in, 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 you know, first of all, who you're up against. Mm-hmm. And the second thing, what the context is. And in ours, with the shaving product, certainly we think it is worthwhile and it gives us that extra protection. And if we're going to a big supplier and you can say to that supplier, we have a trademark, that gives them a certain assurance that we're professional in what we do. And that's important. So go back now to the stuff falling off the back of the lorry. Was that what you told me? Mm. <laughs> I think it's yeah. the, <laughs> we, we don't actually mean stuff that fell off the back of the lorry. <laughs> no, but no, I no think but you know, know what I mean. I do indeed. So you have decided that you're going to set up this company. And uh, then what happens? Is it just you? You and your wife, Mary? You, wife, Mary, and? or who, it, was, or it was Mary and myself uh, mm-hmm. at the start. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we started off with the Minims products. And that was the base for us building up and giving us credibility in the marketplace. And we went from there and we got a range of other products. How? We, uh, we searched marketplace. How? Uh, on the internet, went to trade fairs, went to the pharmacy shows in, in Europe and went to the pharmacy shows in the UK. And you'd see products there that are, and you'd look at them, you'd assess them and say, okay, how would they fit into the Irish psyche? How would they fit into the Irish market? Where is the benefit for the for the consumer or the patient in that product? Where are we with regard to, say, you know, what difference is it going to make to a patient? For instance, we came, we, we were approached by uh, one company and we still have their products after 20 years and the products are called BioExtra. And what they are, there's a saliva substitute, particularly useful for patients who have head and neck surgery or for patients who are receiving uh, chemotherapy, cancer treatment, right? And unfortunately, with a lot of patients, what happens is that when you start in your cancer therapy, that you lose your saliva or the production of saliva reduces dramatically, right? We have a saliva substitute called BioExtra. And the difference that that has made to people is absolutely phenomenal. But you've came across that at a trade show. Yes, something uh, like that. Somebody ap- approached us as okay. a result of going to a trade show, yes. Because when you're walking around a trade show, there can be a hundred, a couple of hundred stands there. Correct. Like, that's graft, is it? It is. The one thing you need, I always say, if we're going to a trade show, is a damn good pair of shoes. Yeah, and because, cups of coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tea, tea. <laughs> because you're, you're standing there the whole time, you're talking to the individuals, you're looking at the product, you're, you have a, just a limited time to size it up and say, okay, have we got the talent to take on this product? What is it going to cost us? How long will it take us to break even? Right? What benefit will it be to the end user, the patient? Right? Is it a product that we will be proud to sell? And all those things come into your head and you try and work it out if it's going to be worthwhile. And you had the benefit of those years that you spent in the uh, in the business already. Yes. But you still wouldn't, I don't imagine, you, you can't know what rival products are like or if, take any, uh, any product, uh, I'll call it Acme. Mm. You think Acme is going to work, but somebody else has a better Acme selling in Ireland. Are you aware of all of the other Acmes? You would, you would check up and see what is the competition doing? Yeah. What is the, com- first of all, what is the competition? What are they doing? How are they selling? Mm. You know, and with my contacts with the wholesalers and the pharmacy business and everything like that, you get that information together and you get sufficient information. You know, the one thing about it is education, right? How much is it going to cost to educate the public about this new product, right? Is it going to be worthwhile? How long is it going to take us before we can make any money out of it? And if it is a question that is going to take us too long, you say, well, that's for somebody else. Well, now, you know that on the podcast that we have to have uh, ad breaks to promote. It's a, uh, it's a product called De Facto Shaving Solution. Have you heard of it? I have De Facto Shaving Oil, yes. Shaving Oil. Yes, it's a very good website, actually, <laughs> defactoshave.com. That's mm. an excellent one, I believe, yeah. Yes, ac- uh, this, absolutely fantastic. This being our 100th uh, podcast, I better take that break and come straight back and talk to Tom Murphy, the founder of De Facto Shaving Oil. The Great Business Show Irish Podcast Awards 2022 Best Business Podcast Nominee. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all-natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non-recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket and your planet. DeFactoShave.com 
Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. And I'm here with Tom Murphy, who is the founder of De Facto Shave Oil, our sponsor. Go back to what you were just talking about there, about the your your, your competition. The you, industrial espionage is a nice word for it. How do you do all of that research? What kind of chats do you have with people about the opposition and what they're doing and how they're doing it. Because like a teeny little country, your industry or your sector is teeny. Everybody knows you within that sector. Mm. So how do you ask those questions? Well, you see, the, because you're in the industry, the, the, the figures are available to you. We have ways and means of getting those figures. <laughs> and it's not espionage. They're freely available. But you, you don't even, know how many boxes of Acme Plus 2 is being sold or whatever. Well, get on to Nielsen and they'll tell you. You'll have to buy the information from them. Ah. And is it down to the granular of that? I mean, how yeah. many boxes are of X are sold or Y have sold? Yes. And you can, you can even get it, say, for prescription medicines or for OTC products, you know, over, over, over the counter products, down to how many packs were sold in each town. Really? Yes. Is that It'll a, cost you to get it. I was going to say, is that expensive? It is. It okay. is expensive, yeah, because there are those in the business who provide that information for you, all legitimately, that's exactly what they do, right? And you have the wholesalers, you have the pharmacists in that sector, and they will always help you. I think it's amazing uh, the, 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 the assistance and the help that is out there, and it's one thing that always uh, bothers me to a certain extent with people in business. You know, they're afraid to ask people and they're afraid to ask questions. Listen, all the people can say, the worst they can say is, no, I'm not giving you that bloody information. And I so agree with you because most people in business that I've ever come across and I've come across very, 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 very many, mm. they want to help. Correct. Once you are not eating their lunch, yes. they're happy. Yeah. And they're kind of, we all are, and anybody in business, we're all kind of busy buddies yeah. and we want to know what they're up to. Correct. It's, it's like peering over the garden wall or something to see what's yeah. next door. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm, I'm an inquisitive individual, I can tell you that. And, I, and, and, you know, my attitude is, you might not go to school every day, but I try to learn something new every day. And practically every day, I do. Like today, for instance, not to trust that bloody sat-nav on my car. <laughs> <laughs> Which brought him to the other end of the world. You, like, Nielsen is one source, and that's a paid-for source. What are the sources to use for your intelligence, your sectoral intelligence? Is that a nice term? Yeah. Um, contacts that I have within the industry. Would you phone people up? Would you say, hey, Absolutely. Jack, how's it going? Yada, yada. Yep. With something in mind that you want to know about Acme mm -hmm. Plus 2 or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, and I meet people at meetings, industry meetings and things like that. And you say, how are you getting on? I see you launch a new product. How is it going for you? Generally, people will... You know, they'll straight up, they, they will tell you how a product is going. Ah, and everybody then, says, oh, it's going fantastically brilliant. No. Do they not? No, 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 no. Not everybody. <laughs> you, you know, you can sift through, through the, 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 sift through those who are just, you know, blowing the BS, simple yeah. as that. But uh, you'll find out the, the, the information that you want. But in a nice way and in a genuine way. And you're not as such... Uh, being mean or usurping their intelligence or anything like that. You're getting the information because you, the chances are, you have something that will be of benefit to them as well. And I always think that there's, you know, there is fantastic, uh, there are fantastic opportunities in collaborating with people. But again, you come back to the, the secrecy of the Irish people. You know, and I say, you won't see it any more than out on the road. Will the hell tell you where they're going to turn next? No way will they even use the indicator on the car. Ah, get no, away. No. Get away. Come on. Are you talking about the reps on the road? I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm talking about everybody. I'm t talking about everybody. Why in Ireland are we afraid to approach people and ask for advice or ask a But question? you have no problem. I don't have any problem. 
But I can't understand how many people won't go. And if you have an idea, so many people say, oh, gee, you can't discuss that with Colonel Amor. He might go and make it himself or he might bring it in himself and everything like that. Well, there's a lovely, lovely guy called Terry McManus who taught me that a long time ago, that an idea in a drawer is not an idea. It's a piece of paper in a drawer. It's a dream. So, That's it's a dream, right. yeah. Mm. So it's a fat lot of good unless you actually do push the boat out a wee bit. Correct. And we also, maybe it's that, I don't know, I don't know it's some kind of anticipatory anxiety that you think that they are, as you say, they're going to nick your idea. Mm. But they probably are thinking about whether the kids are, you know, have, will be playing football later on or something like that. They're completely not thinking about your idea. I know. I know. The thing about it is, you know, there's so, so many opportunities in collaborating with the right people. How big have you made PAMEX? Uh, well, it isn't how big I have made PAMEX. We have a wonderful team of people. I could not have done this on my own. My family, my wife, my kids, you know, they have put up with all, you know, me working morning, noon and night. I, and you have. Oh, I, I have. Really and truly, haven't you? I have, yeah. I have. How many hours a day? How many days a week? I don't I don't count them because Roughly, I... Roughly, come on, talk to me. Would, I you, could, be on, would you be online or whatever you do, 6am hmm. until 10pm? No. no, no, definitely not. Okay. Except in my mind. Okay. But the mind is, never stops. Which is part of the business, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it just never stops. So how hard do you how hard do you work? I work. I think I work very hard. Probably looking back on it, if we're to do something different. How many hours, Tom? <laughs> hours don't mean anything. It's what you do in the hours. But the, you've just said that you kind of apologised to your, your wife and kids that you weren't around. How many uh, hours were you doing? At you know. At well, the peak. I, I always worked hard when I was a medical rep. When I was a medical at rep for Syntex. Peak. How many? This is like. You go off <laughs> nine, nine o'clock in the morning until seven or eight yeah. in the evening. Okay. So you did yeah. a full And then full afterwards, day. you do a few hours after that. So yeah, you did a full 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And are you yeah. still at that? No, no, no. I'm not. I have a wonderful team okay. who support me and I support them. And we work very, very well as a team. And I think when people have. That team mentality and that ownership mentality and that kind of the founders mentality, if I can spread that into the organization. But how can you? They're not founders. You're the founder. Yeah. But if they have the mentality. And how it, do you imbue? That's a nice word, isn't it? You yeah. Imbue lovely with word. Um, with, with regard to that is you give people the responsibility and you give them accountability. But you just don't lend them in and say, this is what you have to do and that's it. Right? You show them the reason why it has to be done and the difference it makes and the one thing we can never ever ever forget about is the customer I said before and I say it again the customer is the reason we're in business and if we don't have customers we're not in business so we have to look after the customers the reps on the road have to look after the customers the marketing department have to look after the customers right finance have to look after customers the people we owe money to and the people who owe us money Right. And how do you check in? You're the boss. How do mm. you check in on the reps on the road, for example, that they are minding the customers? Uh, any any time I feel that I can lift the phone and speak to any of the reps. And I do that. Not, not probably as frequently now as I used to because their manager looks after that aspect of the business, which is wonderful. We have the dental division. We have the pharmacy division. We have the hospital and GP division. So, and they all, you know, report to their own managers. They know exactly what they have to do. We have a wonderful portfolio of products. Absolutely fantastic, unique. And we're in the glorious position now that we rarely have to go and seek out products. For the last number of years, we have customers and companies throughout the world who approach us and they ask us, would we take on their products? Go back to my question about the rep on the road. Yep. How do you find out that that rep on the road is looking after business, in particular looking after your or the company's customers correctly and well? Well, the first thing you'll find out is how are they selling, right? Se and are, there, are their sales good? They all have sales targets to achieve. Are they achieving their targets? Second thing, you look at which products are selling within their range. The third thing you look at. Is okay, just uh, just on that one. Mm -hmm. If you, how many reps have you got on the road? We have three in the UK. Sorry, seven in the UK just recently, and we, we get onto that. 12, 12 in Ireland. Okay, in in Ireland, there's mm -hmm. twelve, and they're selling X. Mm -hmm. Are there regional variations on the sales of X? Yes, there are. 
That's really strange, isn't it? No. I always think that. It's not? No. Why? It's not strange. For the simple reason that you have regional variations in the population. Uh, okay. Dem- Big time. The the demographics. Yeah. Okay. Right? All right. Well, so X is selling really well across the country, mm. except there's one laggard. There's one rep who mm. is not hitting the X target, if you like. Yes. For you- their particular region. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, well, what the manager does, sits down with the rep and says, these are the figures. Mm-hmm. These are how your colleagues are doing on a proportional basis. This is what you set out to do. These are your targets. You're not making these targets here. <clears throat> Are there any particular reasons relative to your particular territory why those targets are not being met? What do you think? And you get the rep involved in deciding what the next steps are. Which is, that's the imbuing of that spirit, is it? Correct. It is. And what happens is they take ownership of what, oh, I see, I'm down here. I didn't realize that. Okay, right. I need to spend more time here or I need to spend more time here. Whatever the story is. So, in terms of size of the organization now, there was you, there was you and Mary, and now how many in total, including the UK? Because I want to get on to the UK. We have 27 yeah. employed. Including the seven over in the UK? Yes. Now, <laughs> Actually, it might be, I, it'll be 28 in uh, two weeks' time. <laughs> well, I love this part of the story because I know enough about it, that um, you were going to retire at the start of this year, weren't you? I was going to retire, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, retirement doesn't, you, if you know me well enough, retirement does not feature in my vocabulary. I think you use some term like that, that you're going to take it easier or step down or step uh, aside. Or... I, um, well, I will, I, I'm, I'm reducing my, my day-to-day responsibilities. From 12 um, hours down to 11 hours. Yeah, it? 11 and a half, <laughs> hopefully. But no. And well, then you said to me, and I'm going, what? That you have now decided to go into the UK. Yes. On retirement. Not you. I know well, it's you not see, you. it's not really retirement when you're doing every day what you love. I know that. It's and as I simple understand as that. that you know. Yeah. But the, no, the thing about it is, uh, I would say that I'm going to spend more time on the business rather than in the business, and there's oh. a big difference. And talk to me about what you're trying to achieve in the UK, because again, I learned a lot from you about this. First of all, there is no place called the UK. Sure, there's not. Correct. In yeah. Britain. It's yeah. regional, and there's the inside the M25, outside mm. the M25. On this occasion, I don't know whether you're allowed to, you're going to tell me all your secrets that you told me. Tell me what you're doing there and how you have gone about it, because it's, I think it tells a very interesting business story. We've, we've started out with three reps in the dental business in the London region, because that's where the population is. Now you're not selling Colgate or anything like that? <clears throat> no. We're selling specific dental products specifically to private dental practices. Again, for specific dental conditions. So it's relatively unique in what we're doing, just like we're doing here in Ireland with the Kin brand of dental products. And if you go into any pharmacy in Ireland, you'll see Kin dental products, whether it be toothpaste, whether it be mouthwash, whether it be uh, for bleeding gums or anything like that, you'll see Kin, K-I-N, right? And we're the Irish distributors for Kin. We market, we promote those products and have been doing so for the last 20 years. And they're a wonderful company, family company also, based in Barcelona, right? So we are now taking those products and dipping our toe into the London market. Why? (laughs) why? Because, first of all, Kin is not in England or Scotland or Wales. But but, but even more to the point, like, have you not got enough? No. (laughs) <laughs> I no. love it. I love it. No, we haven't. When I think of the benefits, <laughs> people are all mad, you know. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I think of the benefits of these products, right, to the patient. <clears throat> Come on, Tom. It's good for you. <laughs> but what is it doing for the patient? It makes a huge difference for the patient. And we're, the London market is ready for a choice up to now. It was very little choice of product for a dentist to recommend to the patient, right? So we're giving the dentist a choice now. And it's not any old dentist. No, it's private dental practices in the London region. And that will be our start. And from there, we'll go to Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Edinburgh, Glasgow. In that order? 
Not particularly in that order. Okay, but just when you choose yes. Birmingham particularly. Yeah, because they're the, cent- they're the centres of population. Yeah, and in uh, in London, mm. like to drill into that detail. I like that, to drill. Oh, the dentist. Oh, gee, okay, yeah. I like it. <laughs> well, it's a pretty polished performance so far. Um, the... <laughs> Tell us about the getting into London in that detail, because you have to, have, those seven reps that you have on the road there, they all have to be fed. Mm. Yeah. That's a big ask. It's a big investment. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to do it. We have to expand the company. We have big, big plans. Have you? We have big plans for the company for, um, by 2025. This is in retirement. <laughs> this was in retirement, yeah. Well, I said we have a great team. We have a marvellous team. And, you know, I, you have often said before, you have to get off the island. So I'm taking your advice. I so agree <coughs> with you. And I presume that part of London was, well, first of all, it's next door in a way, English speaking, yada, yada. But also you said it's not being serviced. If you, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a quick break because I want to maybe spend the last part of this podcast picking your brains to see what advice you would give or what clever ideas you would give young people starting out. In other words, I'm going to get Tom Murphy's brain to get them brilliant business starts or startups. Back in a second. That Great Business Show Irish Podcast Awards 2022 Best Business Podcast Nominee. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make De facto the world's best shaving oil, your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of De facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. And I'm here with Tom Murphy, the founder of De Facto Shaving Oil, our sponsor. But we have him here not because he's the sponsor, because this is our 100th podcast. And who better to have in here except Tom, who is himself an exceptional business person, who is going to spend the next some minutes... I'm going to pick his brains for brilliant ideas for young people starting out because I want anybody listening to say, I could do that. Yes, I want to be in business on my for myself. Mm-hmm. I always try to tell people that, and again, Tom, you know this, when you are working for somebody, the boss gets a third, costs get a third, and your wages get a third. If you're working for yourself, if you keep the costs down, the rest goes into your pocket. So it's mm-hmm. worth going into business. Would you agree? To a certain extent only. Go on. Because, Challenge me. All right. The bureaucratic... Oh, God, he's off. <laughs> uh, challenge that you have in setting up a business and getting into business in Ireland is absolutely appalling. Come on, Tom. It costs 2 and 6% to set up a company. It does, yeah. But the problem is you have to be registered for this. You have to be registered with that. You have to produce your, your, your accounts. And it all costs money. The costs are enormous. And if you take on your first employee, you have to pay full PRSI and everything like that. You get no PRSI holiday. None. Despite the fact that the SME sector in Ireland employs the most people. Correct. There are 250,000 of them and they employ 1.2 million, I think. Isn't that right? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not the the big multinationals. The big multinationals are extremely important. But it is the SME who are keeping this country going. So... You've got that yeah. out. Now, back to... I'm starting. <laughs> back to brilliant ideas from Tom Murphy mm. for young people, doesn't matter what age you are, for people who want to set up on their own. Mm. If you were starting again tomorrow, what area of sectors would you go into? Big question, that. It is. Um, because I'm looking I for think a start. I, 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 well, what I, what I would do, first of all, is uh, I would try and change the education system and teach people at a much younger age, particularly early secondary school, about business. I'd love to do that. And oh, yeah. why business, you know, what it means to be in business, how to get into business, and what the benefits are for you and for others. 
that's not taught. That that's not discussed. Yeah. The meaning and the purpose of money is not discussed. And I think sometimes people haven't a clue <clears throat> about the costs involved and the difference between the cost and the value. I think you need, if you could get that mindset going, I think it'd be wonderful then because I think people would think, gee, maybe I could do something on my own here. What could I do? How could I do it? Where do I get an idea? And uh, the one thing I'd say is always have an open mind. Always, I always say, ABC, always be curious. I have to go down a little rabbit hole here because once upon a time I did teach a course in entrepreneurship in DCU and I wasn't getting through to the young people there until we um, uh, set up an imaginary burger joint or McDonald's or whatever. Hmm. You've never seen, once I showed them the costs and the overheads and the this, that and the other, you've never seen people fire people so quickly, theoretically, when they yeah. saw cost, they said, oh no, they have to go, too many staff bang out the door. Yeah. So, but would but, but you think of that, Connell? They were in their 20s. Yeah, just about it. Just yeah. about yeah. in their yeah. 20s. Yeah. This should be done at 13 years know, of age. I mean, I so agree with you. you know? Back to big ideas, because mm. people are sitting here, uh, listening to this and saying, mm. come on, give us an idea, give us an idea, what should I do, what should I do? I don't know. I I always wonder, like, people queue up to go, no, perhaps our favourite minister for the environment mightn't like this, but, um, you know, people queue up to get their car washed. <clears throat> Why do you have to go to get your car washed? Why isn't there a mobile car wash business? Bet you there, I'm not actually sure. Are there ones that come around? I love there the are, idea. That there idea. are, but yeah. I think it's a great idea. It is a very simple idea. Right. And people, Fair. yeah. Okay, that's a hand. Come on, that's, keep going. That's one, you know. <laughs> um... Uh, why does it take Why does it take a year in Ireland to build a house? Oh, well, now, I you think I mean? it was Margaret Sweeney of Iris Reit. Mm. I interviewed her, not for this, for IIBN, the Irish International Business Network, and uh, she told me that they are looking at printing houses. 3D. In, in 3D. Yeah. Six weeks. Yeah. And one-tenth. One-tenth of the cost. Yeah. I... And at least she is looking at it. It mm. might happen. Mm. But, it's, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's we, we, we need to keep our minds open. People think, oh, this can't be done. This can't be done. You know, never let what you can't do get in the way of what you can. That's my attitude. And if somebody has a dream or an idea, and I don't have, I'm not full of ideas for, for other people as such, but oh, if it is I a question... I bet you are, but you're keeping to yourself. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm quite prepared to share them because I have enough on my place at the moment, as you know. <laughs> but if it is a question, somebody has an idea, I say, follow your dream. Check it out, research it, and go and ask somebody that you can trust. It may not be somebody, and as well as that, sorry, you may decide to go to somebody who... You, you, you're not in a position to trust them in the sense that you don't know them, right? But if they're in business, you'll find again that they will give you a listening ear and they'll tell you, well, I wouldn't do that because X, Y, and Z. However, they might also say, that's a great idea, but you might need more money than you think you'll need. But I think once you break even on that, you'll start making a lot of profit. You know, and it depends what motivates people to get into the business, right? A, a, a wonderful, wonderful book, Right. Making money is killing your business. Never heard of it. Did you not? No. Chuck Blakeman okay. is the guy. And it, it's so, so good. And what well is worth the thesis or the premise of it? Uh, some people feel that, that the only reason they're in business is to make money. And if they want, if that's their goal in life, that's fine. But they said sometimes you concentrate so much on it that you lose everything else about life. Whereas if you get back to your customer, and you see the niche in the market, as we try to do in Pamex, we look for a product where there's a niche in the market, right? And if we get a niche product, there must also be a market in that niche. Because often there may not be a market in that niche. And what would you use for to find out, to do that kind of market research? Do you, for example, have your, now, you know, mm. you, 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 you've been around the block more than once. Do you have your own mentors? Um, no, we don't really, but we have our own pair of no, outside no. eyes. I mean, sit you on our as board. in Tom Murphy. Oh, no. do you? Okay. We do. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and it was, I'd say, one of the things that we did not do soon enough in Pamex, we did not bring in an outside pair of eyes. It's amazing what an outside pair of eyes can do because they look at your business in a completely different way. 
because sometimes you're so close to it, you can't see the wood for the trees. And you say, no, this is what I have to do. This is what I have to do. And you forget something. There might be a car coming down a side road, visible to everybody, but you don't see it because you're concentrating on something else. And the person who's outside the business can bring in and keep you focused. And the outside pair of eyes is, do you ha- does, it, does the business have to be your kind of size to be relevant? Or no. a two-person operation? Two-person operation. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But is and that remember, person a mentor or is that person, a, well, call them whatever they will be? Well, I, I would call them, um, you know, an advisor. Yeah. That's what I'd call them. And uh, I remember going on a... On a course in the IMI, the Irish Management Institute, many years ago when I was on the dole and about starting your own business. And it was the one takeaway I took from that course. Always get an outside pair of eyes. Even though you were on the dole at the time? Correct. Correct. When you start your business, that's the time to get an outside pair of eyes. Okay. Yeah. So keep going. Anything else that you'd say to a person, doesn't have to be young, starting Mm. out? For example... People, despite things booming, people are either walking away or being left from their work, maybe in their 50s. Yeah, but life doesn't end then. Yeah. What would you say to them? I'd say, you know, look at what the possibilities are. What can you do yourself? Some people are out of the frame of mind that they'd like to set up something small themselves. Other people just, they can't do that. It's as simple as that. But look what you can do. What have you got to offer? And contact as many people as possible and say, look, this is my experience. This is what I'm, I've done. And what I would say to them is, write a letter. Ah. Write a letter to the company, whoever you're talking about. And you just never know. You might, you know, somebody, that letter might cross somebody's desk and the person might say, gee, I don't have anything for that individual at the moment. But I tell you, that individual could be useful here yeah. in a different role. Right. You see, I'm odd like that. I will remember and take note and connect people like that. Mm. But I often wonder, am I a bit of a weirdo, a stalker, no. and doing that? Do you no. find that there are many, many, many others like that? Yeah, uh, Probably not that many, but I will be of the same ilk, <laughs> Unf- unfortunately. <laughs> probably as odd as two left shoes. But if I, if I come across somebody that we haven't got a job for them, I might often ring a colleague of mine in another industry or something and say, listen, we had a guy in today. We don't have any uh, vacancy at the moment. But this guy is worthwhile. I don't know whether you have a vacancy or not. Would you be interested in having a chat with him? And I put the two of them together and it's up to them then. And I often make introductions like that. Often. Networking. I'm Mm. I'm a big, keen networker because I'm chair of the IIBN. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in networking? I do. And I think that the Irish are probably the best in the world at it, you know. And before this American term came about, networking, we had our own version of it. The pub. No, it's who you know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's as simple as that. And we use it, I think, in a, in, in a positive way in Ireland. And I think it's, I think it's marvellous because, again, it's collaboration. And, you know, most people in Ireland will help others. I've said that already. I'm saying it again because they will. That's the way it is. That's the way we are. And we're happy to help others. Have you ever gone to your Leo, your local enterprise office? Have you ever used them? Or I have. And I found them very, very um, uh, sympathetic to my ideas. I know they thought I was nuts when we started off PAMEX at first, as, as did a lot of people. And, but I, I, but I, that I, was back then, I think. It was they, back then. They've, they've changed. changed hugely. Since. Oh, yeah. I found them terrific. Terrific, you know, and I found them very, very supportive, very supportive. But then we got into a situation whereby uh, we employed more than 10 people. Ah. Now, they were very... um, Well, here comes another rant. They were No, no, no. (laughs) They were very um, elastic with their approach. Let's put it that way. And again, they were very supportive, despite the fact we were over the 10 limit. And uh, but now they're about to change where they can deal with people uh, with uh, an, an employment situation or an employer who has more than 10. Because one of the issues that you faced was it that you couldn't become an Enterprise Ireland customer. Was that for PAMEX? Well, I had problems with Enterprise Ireland. They didn't, they didn't like me. And I like to say, I will emphasize and be happy to say it out, that their position has changed under their new boss, Leo Clancy. 
How did you get in contact with Leo Clancy? I got uh, an email from Leo Clancy after he was appointed to his new position as head of Enterprise Ireland and he was doing an interview to see what the clients thought of the services. And I decided not to reply because I wouldn't have anything positive to say. I got a second email and I wrote on the, my reply in the second email and explained that I had nothing positive to say. And I then got an email from him asking me would I take a phone call. And I did. And he said he would see what he could do. And that changed things. That is fantastic. I mean, a real hat tip to Leo Clancy, who mm. has been on the podcast. Mm. Like that is, we are a teeny little country. Yeah. And we can make those kind of contacts. Yeah. The boss of EI gives you a, a phone call and sorts yeah. your issue. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was done very well. And I have engaged with them uh, very positively since. And you are doing, <coughs> as you have already mentioned, you're employing, what, 20 in Castle Bar and seven in In, in, in Ireland. We've, yeah, we've, yeah. Yeah, over 20 in Ireland, yeah. Which is the backbone, as you mentioned, but particularly in rural Ireland where, you know, jobs are not flourishing. I mean, Dublin, geez, I mean, the problem is you can't get anybody. But I yeah. presume it's still difficult. It's, it's, diff it's difficult to get the right people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it always was difficult to get the yeah. right people. You know, and the one thing that you need is somebody with a positive and a proper attitude. If they haven't got the attitude, it's a, it's a big challenge. Any observations about the attitudes of younger people going for work, going for jobs? Uh, some of them haven't a clue <laughs> well, that's what but, they're going but for. Were we all like that when we were that age? No, no, I don't think so. I've interviewed people who answered texts in the middle of an interview. I get away. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. no. I don't believe yeah. you. Absolutely, yeah. I've interviewed somebody... Get away. No, sorry. Sorry, yeah. I do not believe that. Really? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, I take it that person is not working with uh, PAMEX. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and did not get a second interview. <laughs> Jesus. That's mad. Sorry. Yeah. I dropped um, it. You know, some people come in and they haven't got their homework done. Mm. And you ask it's them... pretty what? basic. It's pretty basic. Look what do you know about website. the company? Yeah. Look up the website. They haven't done anything. Not a clue. Okay. Some people, I remember one person coming in thinking we were in a different type of business altogether. Mm -hmm. Come here to me. We are about to run out of time, believe it or not. But mm -hmm. we still have to find out who and we have deliberately, you've not, deliberately not told me who this is. Who are you going to hire in a heartbeat? Well, who am I going to hire? And who, who I don't would know. I, or you who would me. I like to have hired? You know, ah, okay. I would say, you know, in, 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 um, if I could choose somebody who's no longer with us, unfortunately. You can do that. But a man that I have uh, a lot of uh, time for, and he's a chap you may have heard of him before, called Lee Ayakoka. Oh, yeah. Absolutely brilliant mind, brilliant personality, wonderful communicator. He was Chrysler, wasn't he? <coughs> Chrysler in the United States. Yeah. So. Yeah. Terrific guy. And in coming back to today, uh, without a shadow of doubt, unfortunately, I will have to be on a um, join the queue for Professor Martin Corley. He's unbelievable. <laughs> He's just unbelievable. He is a very uh, sharp individual. He has a very curious mind, a bit like myself, but he wants to get things done. And I would say the third person in my oh, list, geez, this one is third, yeah, <laughs> because, but he's still alive, is the guy I mentioned already, Chuck Blakeman. Okay. Now go back to Lee Iacocca. Why did you, or do you think that he's interesting or good? I presume that you've, he's got a, or had a book, wasn't there? It was a bestseller, I think, Two. wasn't there? Two. Yeah. Or sorry, he did one. Yeah. And then another guy wrote a critique okay. of his book to see if everything he said was truthful. And? It was. Okay. Yeah. He was, a, he, he was a wonderful communicator. He was a wonderful guy for ideas. And I would say he's the best manager that I've ever read about or come across. Shockingly bad cars, though. Yes, but then he moved to Ford and Ford didn't like him. Or, or was it the, the other way around? I'm I not quite know. sure. Yes. Well, Ford is still, still there. Yeah. Still there, yeah. Okay. yeah. And Chrysler is still there in yeah. one sense. Yeah, yeah, in one sense, yeah. Yeah. That is all very interesting. Any last thoughts that you want to leave with us? Um, yeah, for business, I would say, and it's a, I, I'll just leave you with a quote. Oh, yeah. And it's a quote from, actually, Chuck Blakeman, who wrote that book, uh, Making Money is Killing Your Business. Okay. And it's a great read. And one of the quotes that he has in his book, and I think it's very good, is, never let the tyranny of the urgent overwhelm the priority of the important.
I've heard that before and it really yeah. is, it makes an awful lot of sense. It makes it? an awful lot of sense but yeah. a lot of people, you know, you're working away, you're working hard there and something crops up, oh, this has to be done by 12 o'clock today and you go for it and everything like that and you forget that's urgent but it may not be important. Yeah, It may be urgent, more urgent to somebody else. And I would like to see more people going into business. And I always say, you know, the best advice I ever got was from a colleague of mine who said to me many years ago when I was appointed general manager of Syntex Pharmaceuticals, he said, Tom, he said, always be nice to people on the way up because you never know when you'll meet them on the way down. Well, you're not on the way down. You're on the, no. still on the way up. Absolutely. You're still hiring. You better shout out at you that you are hiring. Are you looking for more people? We're, we're, we're not looking for more people at the moment. We, we're... Uh, I won't say at full capacity, but we will be looking for more people in the new year. But you are looking for people also in, uh, if anybody can make contact for you, in top-end de- dentists in the UK, in correct? The, yes, um, private dental practices in the UK. We're interested in meeting them all and we will be there. And we also have another team in the UK of four reps and we intend to make Alflorex the number one uh, product for IBS in the UK. That's two. And then finally, de facto shaving solution. So shaving de, oil. Jeez, I keep de saying fact, shaving, de fact, shaving, de facto, shaving oil. De facto shaving oil. We're on a mission with de facto. It's made in Mayo. Packaging is made in Mayo. It's a 100% natural product. And we are now on a mission to shave the world. You also need people to distribute same. So we anybody do. on the podcast, listen to the podcast, mm-hmm. contact Tom Murphy, tom mm-hmm. at pamex.ie will get him. And... Uh, distribute de facto to the world. That's it, Tom, from That Great Business Show, episode 100. As usual, we do ask you to share, share, share this podcast. And we're also asking you to vote, vote, vote for the podcast at irishpodcastawards.ie. I have been posting the link both on LinkedIn and on Twitter, so you'll get it there. And do make sure to send the podcast link via WhatsApp to all your pals, because all they do then is they just click on it and they get their personal copy of Ireland's Best Business Podcast. And do it right now because you will get busy, urgent stuff comes in the way and then you forget. So I ask, why isn't your business advertising with us? Great companies like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland and Virgin Media do. Your business should, could do likewise. We have six and a half thousand followers on LinkedIn, 65,000 listeners. They are the best of the best in business. You can talk to them directly via the podcast. And we do record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios where sound engineer today, Mark McCarthy, and studio manager Peter Rice creates the sound that helped us win that best business podcast nomination. And if you want to record a podcast, do use the team here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios. They are, and I always say it, great. If you'd like the media group to produce a podcast for your business, then talk to me, Conal O'Mora, and find me on LinkedIn. All of our great business insights and tips are brought to you every week for the last 100 weeks, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. They back us, please back them. DeFactoShave.com will get them. And don't forget to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have a regular column all about the podcast. So for me, Conal O'Moran, Mira Buchas for listening. August Slan Tamil.